is really good to see everyone again after about a month since our last series. There's talks of snow this weekend, right? So I know, I know. Uh, I had the, um, I saw this, this sled or like a toboggan at like um, TJ Maxx and I had an urge to get it like, oh yeah, this would be so cool, go down the hill. And then I looked at the price tag and it was like 60 bucks and I lost all desire for sledding. Now I'm like, ah, you know, you can get hurt, you can fall off, it's really not worth it. Um, but, you know, when we get like an inch of snow, it's something for us. And so let's enjoy it while it lasts. So we met previously at our New Year's party and I shared a few words there about New Year's resolutions. And if you were there, you remember I said that our New Year's resolutions shouldn't be focused on us being better, on us doing things to be better. Our New Year's resolutions should be focused around being transformed, about being transformed from the inside out because behavior follows desire. And that's important for tonight because at the core of this message is God's word to his people to get their desires to change, for them to seek him more, and that will flow out into their behaviors. Um, open up your scriptures with me to the book of Haggai that is buried in the Old Testament. It's only two chapters long. It's one of the minor prophets, not because he is a lesser prophet, but because it's a shorter book compared to uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And I'm going to start with verse 1 and then give a little context. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So we have Haggai here going before like the governor of Judah, the civil leader, and then the religious leader, the high priest. And he's about to tell him something from God. Up to this point, they had been in Jerusalem, and they were living comfortable lives. But God had a message for them, that in their comfort, they were disobeying his will. Sixteen years prior or so, they had just come back from Babylon. If you remember from your history classes in Sunday school, they were in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. The temple was destroyed during that time. And they were taken away from their homes into the city of Babylon. After 70 years, they had passing to go back, by order of the king, to go back and to rebuild the temple, to reestablish themselves in there. And just read the books of Ezra, um, of uh, Nehemiah, and you'll see how God really gave them courage and really gave them a, a fervent spirit and speed to start building. They started building so fast that when they finished the foundation of the temple in record time, their neighbors started to get a little worried. Because naturally, after 70 years of being gone, other people moved around, right? If you have a rival city, if you have a rival people living in Jerusalem, and then all of a sudden they're gone, well, you can imagine that the people from around will go and say, hey, this is a nice looking house. Hey, this is some nice stuff that they left behind. And you start to enjoy that and get used to it. And so when they came back, their neighbors didn't really like that. One of their neighbors, the Samaritans, really tried to stop this process, and they appealed to the current king of the Persian Empire. Not the one that let them go before, but another guy. And they said, look, these guys are building too fast. They're coming in, they're disrupting everything. You have to tell them to slow down. And so by order of the king, of another king, they stopped construction on the temple. Even though they were supposed to continue it because that was the will of God. 16 years passed 16 years in which they did not do anything to rebuild the temple. And God gives a message through Haggai to the civil leader and to the religious leader. And he says in verse 2, Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. These people say it's not time to build 
the house of the Lord. I mean, in a way, they have been for 16 years living comfortable, maybe peaceful lives. And they're saying, we're not going to do it right now. We're too busy. We don't have the time for it. Maybe in the beginning, they tried to build a temple. Maybe in the beginning, they tried to go against the king's orders. But after a while, they found, you know what? It's not worth the fight. It's not worth the effort. It's just not the right time for this. And God came and rebuked them and said, you guys are saying that this isn't the right time? And we're familiar with this in our lives. Because many times, we and I have said, I just don't have time for this. I don't have time. Now can't be the right time to do this for God. I've heard it all. I've heard it saying, well, you know, right now, I'm too young to follow Jesus, maybe when I'm older. Right now just can't be the right time. If you're asking yourselves those questions, I can tell you that now is the right time because the Holy Spirit is the one that brings that before you and that decision before you of whether to follow Christ or not. And guess what? Tomorrow is not yours. James 4.14 says, Come now you who boast about tomorrow, about going to a city and doing such and such thing. What is your life? It's but a vapor. Tomorrow is not yours. Or maybe you've accepted Christ, but you say, you know what? I, I'm just not going to get baptized right now. I'm going to wait until I feel worthy enough to get baptized. Well, that's the whole point of getting baptized is we're not worthy. That's exactly what the baptism signifies, that you're dead to yourself, to your worthless self, and you've submitted everything to a worthy God. That's what that means. If you wait for a time, for a worthy time to be baptized or to take the next step in your spiritual walk and obeying the will of God for your life, there's never going to be a worthy time because we have nothing worthy in ourselves. It's only by the grace of God. It's only by his worthiness, only by his holiness that we can do anything. Amen? It's only by his power. Right? Just don't have time to read scripture. You know, I don't have time to take upon myself those New Year's resolutions of reading the Bible in one year, of praying more, of fasting more. We make time for what's important to us. There are always going to be 24 hours in one day. That's not going to change. The question is, how are we going to use that time? I'm sure that the Israelites had their own excuses of why now wasn't the best time. And we have our own excuses as well. For all the times that God asks us to obey his will, all the moments that God asks us to trust him and to do what he's called us to do. But sometimes we make those excuses. We make those because it's easier. We make those because we find that we overlook time for God and we focus on time for ourselves. And this year, if we've taken a plan, if we have a resolution, and you have a vision for this year, it's important to keep in mind that one of the priorities is to consider the priority of time. Where you spend your time and on what you spend your time. Because that's going to show where your desire is. And out of desire, the behavior comes. If you have something like that for this year, you have to keep that in mind. God wanted them to rebuild the temple, not just to give them busy work. God never asked us to do something just to keep us busy. The temple was the center of, 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 of culture, the center of their lives, the center of their worship. It is the place where the physical presence of God was in the Holy of Holies. God wanted them to rebuild the temple, not for them to do something for him and appear busy and pious, but for them to build that temple so that they can meet with him and have fellowship with him and be in his presence. God never asked us to do things for him in church, to come to band practice, to come to choir, to come to services, to church services, just for us to be busy because we have nothing else to do on Fridays and Sundays and Tuesdays and all the other days of the week. God asks us to do those things because I have the desire of our heart should be to meet with him and to speak with him. Because when we follow the will of God and when we, when we obey the will of God in our lives, it's always followed by blessings for us and glory to God. That's why he wants us to follow his will. That's why he wanted them to follow his will and to rebuild the temple. He's saying, 
You guys say that now is not the time? I want blessings for you. I want honor from you to me. And the best way to do that is to rebuild the temple because there we can worship. There we can offer the forgiveness of sins. There we can, we can commune. There the high priest can atone for the sins of the people once a year. That is what God wanted, not just to give them busy work. God doesn't want to give you busy work in your life. And let me tell you something that took me a long time to figure out, but I want to share it with you. If you find that time after time of coming to church, of coming to band practice, choir, anything, is just exhausting you, not physically, but spiritually, something has to change. And I know some of the leaders might not like me saying that. I'm the, you know, the leader of the youth department as well, and I say that for all of you and for all of us. Because when we come and worship to God, it should give us life. It shouldn't take it away. When we come to worship, when we come to pray, we should leave from here saying, God was good tonight. God was amazing tonight. You know, even if I didn't get ecstatic or, 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 or pray really loud or whatever, and when those times happen, that's good. That's great. There's not, you know, being emotional is part of being human. That's part of us too. But even in those times where we have a challenging message, those times where we have a deep thought, when we say, you know, this really gives me something to think about. This really gives me something to work on in my life. If you find yourself just being so preoccupied with doing things for God that you don't have time to talk to God and to obey his commands for your life, something is wrong. And the earlier that we can understand that, the better. Because we're supposed to obey God and talk with him and worship him and honor God. And God says, I want for you to do that as well. And when God says for us to rebuild the temple, when God asks us to play in the band and the worship team to preach, when he asks us to do that, it's not so we can be busy and keep up appearances. It's so that we can meet with him, so that we can worship with him. Amen. That's the purpose of it. If in this year you have uh, some resolutions that you want to do, do them for the right reasons. To spend time with God so that it's life-giving. So that when you leave from a church service or you leave from serving the department, there's life. And yet you may be tired physically, we all are, but at the end of the day you're saying, God, you've been good and you've worked and I praise you for it. Amen. That's the God that we serve. Search to see if you're postponing obeying God's obedience or if you're postponing obeying God's will in your life because of time. The Hebrew people were treating the dilapidated temple like it was fine, but God said it wasn't okay. They were serving themselves by keeping the time focused on themselves. So if you have a vision for this, if you have a plan, make sure that you keep in mind the priority of time. Verse 2 continues. Verse 3, rather. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Hmm. They've had 16 years to work on themselves. They've had 16 years to build up their own houses. They came back to their land. They came back to their farms, and they built it up. And there's a word in there, paneled houses. If you look at the root of it, it means that it's something that is expensive or luxurious. Meaning in their homes, they may have had panels of wood on the walls and on the ceiling. Not just a home for them to have a roof over their heads, but a fancy home. Not just any kind of Ikea furniture. This is like Pottery Barn furniture or whatever, right? Some higher-end furniture. I don't know. I don't do the shopping, right? It's a high-end thing, and God's saying... Oh, now is not the time to build my house? But your houses have wood paneling on the walls? You guys ever been in one of those like 80s, 70s homes that has the wood panels on the house, right? But these ones apparently look nice. And God said, you have time to honor your own homes. And as he said in Malachi, I believe, where is my honor? If I'm a father... Where's my honor? You say, how have we dishonored you? You haven't come to worship. You haven't set your priorities straight. You valued comfort over counting the cost. 
you have a vision, if you have a plan for this year, keep in mind the priority of counting the cost. Following Jesus requires a cost. Jesus says himself in John 12, verses 24 through 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And one more verse that ties in with this, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The paradigm or the almost backwards thinking of the Christian life is that if you want to gain something, you must first lose it. If you want life, you must first lose your own. If you want eternal life in heaven, you must be dead to the temporary life here on earth. If you want to follow God and serve him, you must stop following yourself and stop serving yourself. And that means giving up some things. It means there are some things that we as children of God cannot do anymore. Galatians says that we cannot follow, and the Corinthians, in several places, we cannot follow our fleshly desires. A person born of God does not have those desires any longer to live in that sin, to walk by the flesh. Instead, we are to walk, as it says in Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit. When we do that, we leave some things behind that aren't for our benefit, and we gain eternal things. But then Jesus says, pick up your, not your, you know, comfortable home, your comfortable car. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. God wasn't rebuking them necessarily for comfortable living. Now hear me out. He wasn't rebuking them for having paneled, you know, boards on their walls. He was rebuking them for comfortable living by means of disobeying God's will and of putting down their cross and putting down their own comfort and serving themselves rather than God. That's a key difference. We have homes, praise God. We have cars, praise God. We have clothes on our backs, praise God. But if these things get in the way of honoring God and of obeying God's will, and of listening to God when he says, I want you to build this temple. I want you to serve me. I want you to be in this church. I want you to, to love others. I want you to love me more than you love anything else. If we say, God, I'm going to honor my comfort first, we are in disobedience to God's will. And then any plan, any vision that we have for this year or any year won't come to fruition. We will be unsatisfied because we are not counting the cost. It doesn't necessarily mean to let go of physical things. Because yes, Nicodemus said, I'm going to sell all my things after he met with Jesus. I'm going to sell all of them and give them to the poor. I, I, I don't want them anymore. Jesus transformed his life. It might not mean a physical thing, but it means that emotion that's tying you to that physical thing. For some people, it could be a phone that, like, that is their life. If they don't have that, they lose connection with people around them. For others, it might be a car, or it might be a relationship even. Something that if God calls us to let go for his sake, are we able to do it? Do we hold things loosely in our hand? So that when God says, you have to give this up, we can say, okay, God, it's not me, it's you. I want to honor you. I want to serve you. Are we paneling things up in our life and living in this comfortable environment, not just for, not that comfort is a bad thing, but we're doing so at the extent that we're disobeying God. That's the key. Are we focusing so much on things in this life that we ignore the things of the next? Because it's uncomfortable. 
you have a vision, if you have a plan for this year, make sure you get the priority of growth right. I'm sorry, of sacrifice right. That we need to give up some things. We need to count the cost. And the word continues. We find ourselves in chapter 5. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I want you guys to remember that word. Consider or think about. Think about your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in, into a bag with holes. Sometimes I just love reading scripture and seeing God's like, sarcasm or his, his um, the way he just points out the irony in things. God's saying, let me get this straight. You have time for yourselves. You want to focus on yourselves. And you want to focus on your comfort so that you can be satisfied. Well, guess what? You're eating, but you're still hungry. You planted seed, but nothing happened. You strive for things, but it's never enough. And the money you do get is never enough to satisfy your needs either. It's like a bag with a hole in it. All the money's falling out. God's trying to say, don't you see? Your satisfaction is not in time and in comfort for yourself. It's in, it's in time and worship with me. God says, and he continues, I'm the one that has caused these things. I'm the one that has not allowed your seed to grow and the money to last you. Because I want to turn your mind around. I want to transform you from the inside out. And I care for you. And I don't want the things of the world to bring you satisfaction and comfort. So you know what? I'm going to make them a curse in your life. Because you're not honoring me, because you're not obeying me, God is a loving God and he's doing so out of love. But he says, I don't want you to get absorbed in that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a, put a hole in your wallet. All right? I'm going to have someone hack your bank account. All the money's going to be gone. You're going to be like, what is happening? I'm going to make you have to go to the auto shop every other week with a flat tire. Because I want you to stop putting so much trust in that bank account and that money. I want you to stop putting so much emphasis on the clothes that you wear and what other people think about you. I want you to focus on me and find satisfaction in me. Because God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him, right? That's the God that we serve. That's where he wants our minds to go. That's why he starts off with consider your ways. Think about it. Start from the inside. We said earlier that whenever we see heart in scripture, that's where the, um, the Israelites thought that you know, thoughts were stored and emotions and everything was in the heart, not the physical one, but that's just what they, what they used for all our thoughts, or all our desires. God's saying use the stuff from the inside first. Let it come from the inside out. Consider your ways because God is focused on the heart of the issue. This isn't a prosperity teaching here. That if we just obey God, he will give us blessings and everything that we need and live a life of luxury. But it's a principle here that if we honor God with our time, with our resources, with everything that we have, our life will flourish and we will find our satisfaction in him. It may not look wealthy like other people. It may not look healthy like other people, but it will be different from other people. And it will be for God. And we'll find your true satisfaction in him. Because God is the only one that truly and fully satisfies. That's why it's important for constant examination, for constant, every day when we pick up our cross, to have these words in mind. Consider my ways. Think about my desires. Because if we honor God with what we have if we honor this principle and the priority of true growth in our lives, of true satisfaction in our lives, then God will, could give us the stuff on top of that, all the money and all the things on top of that because our desires aren't caught up in those things. But even if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because if you haven't lost Jesus, you haven't lost anything. What do we need to consider tonight? What do we need to think about tonight? Maybe the dreams and aspirations that you've had for this year, the resolutions for this year have been driving you, have been pushing you. Maybe you've had all your energy focused on them. 
Maybe you're trying to build a level of comfort by having a larger cushion of money in your bank account or more relationships, whatever. Consider your ways. Think about your ways. Is God being honored in them? Are we finding our satisfaction in those things or are we finding them in God? Because if you want to grow this year, it comes only from finding your satisfaction in God. We can't grow. We can't truly grow through material things, through education, through money. We can't. Only by the grace of God and only by his promise. Amen? And in verse 7, I love how God continues this and says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, again, consider your ways. Think from the inside. Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. He continues there and says, I've not caused the rain to fall. I've not caused the seed to grow because you haven't been obedient to my will. And that's to build my house. And back in verse 7, remember I said to keep that thought in, in, in mind, consider your ways. Before he tells them to go build a house, to do something with their actions, a behavior, he tells them to check their desires. As we said before, God wants our desire to be him and his glory alone. That will drive our behaviors. If we go the other way around, if we try to change our behaviors first and then hopefully somehow we can find a passion for God, it'll never work. It'll never work. You'll be a church member sitting here in 50 years, coming to every single church service, coming to every prayer meeting, trying to please God, trying to be perfectly obedient by doing things, and you'll never, ever mount up to it because your desire is not in the right place. Your desire is to be seen. Your desire is to be honored by men. Your desire is to be appreciated by others, but not to honor God. Because it didn't start from the inside. It didn't start with a desire to honor God truly. You have the right desire. You have the right aim. You could be at every church service. You could be even more. Because you're doing it for the right reasons. Consider your ways first, then go and get the wood. Consider your desire first. Seek God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, with everything you have before you're playing the trumpet, before you're singing on the team, before you're in the media team, before you come to church service. See God in your own life. Past your comfort, past the time that you set aside for yourself. Seek God in your own life. Consider your ways. And then go get that wood. Then go do something for God. Then go rebuild that temple. Then But if you're not in God's will, if you're not desiring him, if you're building up your own house, as he said to the people, if you're building up only for yourself first, God's saying, my relationship with you is in ruins and you're doing all this other stuff on the outside. And I'm trying to cut these things away from your life so that you can turn to me and see me and worship me and come back to the heart of the matter. God is always, always interested in your heart, in your desire. That is the first thing he sees. When Israel was anointing a new king, it went through all the brothers of David and none of them passed the test. Little David, may not have been little at the time, we don't know, but he was the youngest, passed the test. Because God said, he is a man after my own heart. Was David worthy? Not more than any of us. Was Moses worthy? A murderer? Not more than any of us. Gideon, the least in his clan, a nobody? Not more than any of us. But they wanted to talk to God. They wanted to honor God. They said, God, I've been through it all. I've had it. Moses said, I don't want to be considered a prince of Egypt anymore. I want to serve God. God, I'm coming back and I'm rebuilding this temple. God, I'm coming back, and I'm at this tabernacle, and I want to meet with you. 
I'm coming back, God, and I want to see your face. I want to experience your presence in this place because I need that first before I go out and build anything else. I need that relationship before I go out and get the wood and build the altar of fire. I need that voice from you. I need that spirit to encourage me and to speak to me before I do anything else in your name. Before I lead a nation of people, God, I need to hear from you and I need you to lead me. I'd like for us to stand up and, and invite the team back up here. God desires our obedience. God desires our perfect obedience. Unfortunately for us, this is impossible. By ourselves, this is utterly impossible. We will try to do things the other way around. We will try to be better instead of being transformed. And we will do stuff from the outside and hope to impress God or to earn his grace or to earn his favor. But we have it backwards. There's only one who has satisfied the condition of perfect obedience. Only one who has satisfied the condition of never sinning. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the example set before us. He is the high priest. And if in this evening the Spirit has been speaking to you and calling you to go back and consider your ways and go back to that temple and start rebuilding it and start the relationship with God, maybe restart it for the first, for however many times, but get back there. Or maybe for the first time, go there and meet God in that place, in that tabernacle, in that place of meeting. And seek not your time, seek not your comfort, seek not your growth through material things, but seek first the kingdom of God. All these things shall be given to you. Your desire will drive your growth. Your desire will drive your behavior. I pray that our desires to follow the will of God in this evening, amen. To come back to that temple, to come back and to seek him with all of our hearts. And then to go out and to show the world what God has done for us and to do things for God and for his kingdom and for his glory. First, let's come back. At the beginning, this first student night of the year, let's make sure we have our priorities straight and not think about our own houses when maybe God's house in our life needs to be looked at a little more. I pray that the spirit works in us and moves in us as we go into worship in this time. Amen.